Thank you, everybody, for coming. And welcome to the presentation on fairness for scikit-learn pipelines with Ali. Um, so why should you care about fairness in machine learning pipelines in general? Well, um, because if you don't care about it, then it can very well happen that your machine learning pipelines explain, uh, 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 have bias, and bias in various different directions, maybe by gender, maybe by race, maybe by various other projected outputs, age, and so on. And why should you care about that? Well, again, there are many reasons for that. Um, there are laws and regulations which you don't want to break. Uh, hopefully you have some personal values that influence um, what kind of technologies you are building. Probably your employer or the organization that you work for also has values that you want to comply with. And then for, uh, for organizations, of course, uh, bias in machine learning is a big deal for their reputation and thereby also for their business. Now, in this presentation, I'm going to focus on algorithmic fairness metrics and mitigators. Now, that means there's another incredibly important topic around bias and fairness that I will only touch upon uh, very little in this presentation, which is the societal issues. Um, now, uh, in terms of algorithmic issues, I'm going to talk about tabular data with protected attributes, I'm going to focus on binary classification, and I'm going to uh, talk a lot about noisy trade-offs because uh, that's what you face in reality when you're trying to work with uh, fairness in machine learning. Now, in terms of societal issues, um, there's no consensus on which techniques are right. There's actually no consensus on uh, what constitutes fairness. And um, I can't pretend that I have the right opinion in that. And so what I will attempt to do in this talk is to show you various tools and show you various definitions for fairness so that you can then choose wisely among them. Um, in fact, these, the, these differences, as you will see, sometimes go quite deep, so they, they can be uh, uh, tracked down to some axiomatic worldviews that people might have about fairness. Now, um, let us start where people usually start when they have a data science project, which is with a data set. And so there are various things that you can find out in the data set um, without any fancy techniques, just by looking at it. Um, so, for this presentation, I'm going to use as a running example the so called Credit G dataset. This is a, a, a dataset about loan approvals. As you can see, it's a tabular dataset, um, it has 1,000 rows. Um, there's a label column Y, and uh, in this case, all the labels are either good or bad, good meaning deserving of credit, and bad meaning uh, they get their loan declined. Um, that means it's a binary classification dataset. And then there are 20 features, uh, actually I'm not showing all of them on the slide for space reasons, um, but as you can see, among the features that, that are collectively called X, uh, two of them are called out specifically as protected attributes. One of them, H, um, uh, is a numeric protected attribute, and then the other one, personal status, um, makes it obvious what the gender of the loan applicant is, and uh, therefore it's, it's also a protected attribute, uh, sex. And um, now, before, before you try to even figure out what the bias in this data set is, um, it's good to um, have some definitions of what you consider um, favorable outcomes and what you consider protected groups. So um, you can see a little bit of Python code here at the top. It's, a, it's just a dictionary. Um, this Python happens to be also valid as a JSON object. Um, it defines favorable labels as good. Um, so loan approval is a favorable thing for most people. And then it defines the two protected attributes that we already talked about, personal status and age. But in addition, it also defines for both of them which values for that attribute are considered as a privileged group. Now, um, this is debatable for your data set. You might come up with different definitions, different metrics, and so on. Um, uh, but let's assume that, uh, that somehow you came up with that, or maybe somebody in your organization came up with that. And now you, you need to work with it. Um, and you can see that the fairness definition for the categorical attribute, personal status, just lists the values that are considered in the privileged group versus the, uh, the fairness metadata for the continuous attribute, age, uh, lists a range. So, uh, so in this case, everybody from age 26 to 1,000 is considered privileged, which, as you can see, um, puts the cutoff about here in the histogram. Um, and then, even in this histogram for the, uh, for the personal status, you can see that the group distribution is actually quite uneven. So, 
there are more male singles than all female groups combined in this data set. And that's not even counting the other two male categories here. Um, that in and of itself is, um, may or may not be considered biased yet, um, but uh, we will see that it actually makes machine learning on this data, especially when you're trying to achieve um, fairness, a little bit more challenging because you will have fewer instances to generalize from for the unprivileged groups. Now, to drill down a little bit further into this uh, data set, another thing that you can do is you can use membership uh, in the privileged and unprivileged group for the two different classes to kind of uh, split your data set into more groups. So you can binarize the personal status as 0 or 1, and you also can binarize the age as 0 or 1 by using the fairness metadata up there. And then you can uh, find out, um, for instance, this means male, uh, old, sorry, male and old, and there are, um, there are a total of 605 instances in that group out of which 447 received a favorable outcome in this data set. Now, you see uh, that for this group, the ratio of favorable outcomes uh, in the data set was the largest. Uh, for a young female, the ratio of favorable outcomes was the smallest, and then you can see for the other intersectionalities, it's, it's somewhere in between. And um, now, uh, this actually brings us to one of these worldview questions. So. Um, there are two worldviews uh, that are very articulately, uh, articulately described in a Kakum paper uh, on the impossibility of fairness, different value systems require different mechanisms. One worldview is we are all equal. So if you have sufficiently large subgroups of your population and there is some systemic um, uh, disparity in terms of, oh, the ratio of loan application, of loans being accepted for one subgroup is much higher than for another then uh, if you believe that we are all equal, then there's probably some structural bias and you can't really trust the data. Now, another viewpoint would be that what you see is what you get. Um, so this viewpoint uh, says, I totally trust my data. I believe not only is my data right, but it in fact correctly represents reality. And if that is the worldview that you subscribe to, then um, what you will strive for is um, the best individual terms that you can get. So, if two individuals are um, equal among all their features, then you will attempt to also give them the same outcome in terms of the prediction. Now, um, algorithms, unfortunately, uh, have a hard time guaranteeing between just one of these, uh, let alone both together. In fact, it's impossible in a data set like the one that we just saw to guarantee both together. Because uh, they really, you have two choices. either somehow your algorithm manages to, uh, to make predictions such that the ratio of positive or favorable outcomes is exactly the same for the two groups. Well, in that case, it has to um, sometimes uh, flip the outcomes that you would have gotten based on the ground truth, because you just saw in the ground truth the outcomes were not the same ratio. Or vice versa, let's say you get an, uh, an algorithm that somehow matches the ground truth perfectly, well, then it might it actually use those uh, equal assumptions. Was there a question? Can you give us an example of a weekly data set? Because I feel like I'm often, I've often been told that you should always try to balance things out. You know, you psych it. You know, you're supposed to try to create your cross, your, your cross validation like by balancing, by balancing a little important. So, um, yeah, I, I think you should, uh, um, so I guess there, there are two questions here. One is, is data ever perfectly correct? Probably not. Um, but then the other question is, well, what is what would be fair? And um, again, let me let me give an example. Um, so for uh, for green card applications in, in the United States, at some point they had a lottery system, and so the lottery system implicitly makes an assumption that um, well, the only way to make it fair is by not looking at the individual at all and just randomly give out green cards. Now um, I don't know if I agree with that, um, but that's not really. Uh, I mean, it's not my I, I, I don't get to make these decisions. Um, but, uh, but at least that seems to be based on a fundamental belief in, uh, in, in uh, what you see. All right, so these are the axiomatic assumptions. Um, now, another thing that you can find out just by looking at the data set is uh, feature importances. And uh, here I'm actually just using the scikit-learn permutation importance function. Uh, what it does is, 
it evaluates the importance of each feature by permuting the values of the, of the value in that column. And so if you do that, basically if you randomize the values in that column, then uh, they will carry no predictive power for the final model. And then you can look at, okay, well, if I did that and kept all the other features the same, how much predictive performance did it? And so um, I, I then ordered the features by the feature importance. So the most important feature is at the top. Um, ch uh, checking status seems to be very important for determining whether somebody gets loaned. And as you can see, the protected attributes, well, age is fairly high up in the feature importance. Uh, personal status seems to be kind of roughly half the way down. Um, so they do carry some uh, predictive power over the final outcome. Now, one idea one might have is, okay, well, if, uh, if we want to make things fair, why don't we just remove these two features and then train our classifier, problem solved. Now, um, the next set of data uh, will show you that that's not likely to succeed. Or not likely to have the desired effect. We won't get surface pairs from that. So here, I, again, I'm plotting feature importance, but not feature importance for predicting the target label. Instead, I'm plotting feature importance for predicting the binding rights predicted attribute. So, for instance, for personal status, I'm trying to predict zero or one from all the other features. And so, if I look at all the other features and I'm trying to predict personal status, then apparently the credit amount is the most predictive feature, which I don't know why, but uh, that's, that's what the uh, data gave us. Age, apparently, in this data set is also strongly correlated with gender for whatever reason. Um, and then, similarly, if you just look at the other predictive attributes, apparently, um, Housing status is highly predictive of age. Um, that is maybe less surprising because, uh, depending on where people are in their life, they move around and, and have different kinds of housing situations. And um, so, but really, the take home from the takeaway from this is that um, since you can use the other features to predict the predicted attributes, um, just removing the predicted attributes doesn't guarantee that your model will be fair because it might still. Um, make uh, like have a dis disparate uh, ratio of outcomes for uh, the privilege group versus the other privilege group. All right, so that's um, I mean there could be more things that people can find out from the data, but uh, but let's move on to metrics. So why do we need metrics? Um, well, uh, as we just saw, this data set is biased. Probably any pipeline that you build for this data set won't be perfect in terms of fairness either. Um, so the question then becomes, okay, how do you compare two pipelines in terms of how good they are with respect to fairness? And that's what you need a fairness metric for. Um, of course, you can also use metrics more actively, kind of algorithmically, so you can actively optimize for a metric. And uh, to do that, of course, you have to pick which one. And since there are different worldviews, there are many. Um, now, before I get into that, the fairness metrics, let me just um, uh, cover a little bit of background, just um, predictive performance metrics for scikit-learn. So in scikit-learn, um, there are APIs for metrics, and then there are scoring APIs. And you can see in line two, for instance, I'm creating a scorer from the scikit-learn balanced accuracy metric. Um, you might wonder why balanced accuracy instead of just vanilla accuracy. Um, the reason is that this data set is somewhat imbalanced to begin with. And so if you just optimize for accuracy, then uh, then you might uh, do quite poorly on the, on the less represented uh, tables. Now, um, once you have instantiated this EA scorer variable, line three shows one straightforward way to do it. You can just pass in the pipeline and the data set, and it will spit out a number. Uh, then lines five through eight show one place in the scikit-learn API where these kind of scorers are typically used, and that's for cross-validation. So in cross-validation, you're passing in that scorer and the data set and the pipeline, and then uh, one more thing that you have to specify is you have to specify some cross-validation approach. Um, I recommend stratified uh, capable cross-validation for, um, for this kind of categorical uh, target data, data set. Um, and then finally, another place where scores show up in the scikit-learn API is for grid search, or also for randomized search, basically for automatic algorithm selection. And again, um, the DA scorer that I instantiated earlier um, shows up as an argument. Now, um, I love scikit-learn. Unfortunately, it doesn't actually come with fairness metrics. It comes with all these accuracy metrics. And so we built this open source library where we provide some fairness metrics um, that are 
uh, that can be passed in exactly the same cases where you could pass in the first matrix from second term. And um, specifically in this talk, I'm going to talk about uh, five of them. And uh, these are all based on different assumptions of what you want to accomplish. So the first one, disparate impact. Um, you can uh, let me just read the formula to you in, in, in words. Um, so disparate impact is quantified as the likelihood of getting, getting a favorable label, given that the instance is in the unprivileged group, divided by the likelihood of a favorable label for instances in the privileged group. In other words, if um, if in, if individuals in the um, unprivileged group have a lower rate of favorable labels, then this number will be below 1. If these two groups have exactly the same rate of favorable labels, then the metric will be 1, and that indicates perfect fairness as far as this metric is concerned. Um, you can actually also uh, overshoot in the other direction, where uh, um, the, there was a case actually uh, that went to court in the United States, and where the judges basically decided that uh, on an 80% rule, they said, well, if one group um, gets only 80% of the positive outcomes from, uh, compared to another group, then uh, that constitutes bias and, uh, and has to be fixed. And of course, that 80% uh, that works in the other direction as well. Now, um, you might want another possible metric is something called symmetric disparate impact, which basically says, well, any time that the number is above one, you just divide uh, tickets with the group. And um, uh, the advantage of that is then it's only one threshold, um, so it will, uh, uh, it's more readily usable for algorithms that try to minimize. Um, of course, I mean, as I compare these, uh, there are really good arguments to be made for any one of these, and uh, again, it depends on your own personal views as well as the views of the organization and the law system which you operate, which one is actually appropriate. Um, statistical parity difference. Is almost the same formula as here, except that there's a minus sign. So you're subtracting the rates instead of dividing the rates. Um, this equal opportunity difference is, uh, is slightly different. So it basically uh, checks for true positives. So when the predicted uh, label and the ground truth label are both positive, um, and it checks the rate of those true positive, so the true positive rate for the unprivileged group and subtracts then the true positive group. For the uh, for the privilege, sorry, true positive rate for the privilege group. Um, now again, uh, whether true positives are the right thing to optimize for uh, depends entirely on the circumstances. So, uh, so in some circumstances, maybe it's uh, it's a good thing to optimize for true positives. Uh, in some other circumstances, maybe false positives are the one the, the thing that you really want to avoid at all costs, or false negatives, or whichever one it is, right? Um, but yeah, so this is the definition of the equal opportunity difference. And then finally, I'm also including a field index, which is the expectation for the, for um, what uh, for this metrics purpose is defined as the benefit. So the, the benefit is uh, the, the predicted label minus the ground truth label plus one. So it basically um, says, well, from the perspective of an individual, the benefit is the highest when they get a positive outcome, even if the label was negative. Um, so that's a very kind of individual-centric metric. And as a matter of fact, when you look at this formula, you can see it does not look at the protected attributes. It doesn't consider the group membership whatsoever. So it's a fairness metric that is uh, really subscribing more to the WYSIWYG mindset than the we are all equal mindset, because it completely ignores uh, whatever protected attributes might be in the data. Um, one last thing I wanted to point out with these metrics is that um, uh, these top three do not mention the predicted labels. They basically just have one Y. They don't have a Y hat and a different Y. Uh, practically, that means that you can evaluate, use this metric to evaluate a data set even when you don't have an estimator for it yet. Um, so you can evaluate the data set and figure out, okay, what is the bias in the data? And then you can go and evaluate an estimator, and you can see, okay, what is the bias in the predictions of the estimator? And then you can even compare the two, and you can say, oh, this estimator made reduced bias or increased bias. So um, just briefly, I mean, we already saw this, this uh, fairness info uh, definition up there. And in our API, the way to create a symmetric disparate impact store is by just passing this fairness info in uh, using uh, the, the Python uh, double star to positive as keyword arguments. 
And once you're done with that, you have this DI scorer and you can pass it to your grid search or your cross validation or your randomized search or whichever API from scikit-learn you want to use. All right, so let's try it out. Um, on the left, you see the pipeline that you might use for this data set. So in this data set, maybe you want to uh, predict out all the categorical columns and one-hot encode them, predict out all the numeric columns and min-max scale them, and then concatenate, I guess, the features from, uh, from those two sub-pipelines back together. And then you might want to try various different classifiers um, on the pre-processed data. Over here on the right, um, on the x-axis, I'm showing symmetric dispersion pattern. So the further right, the more fair according to this metric. Uh, of course, you could do this with different kinds of metrics. On the y-axis, I'm showing balanced accuracy. So the further up, the, uh, the more accurate according to this metric. And so really, that means in this diagram, the further you can move in this direction, the better your estimator is. And, um, Note that these estimators don't inherently try to either improve or uh, degrade fairness, um, but they do have that effect, uh, nevertheless, even though they don't try because they, they are completely oblivious uh, to that. And so, as you can see in this experiment, um, uh, gradient boosted trees from, uh, from scikit-learn um, kind of landed at the highest accuracy, but on the other hand, K neighbors uh, landed at the lowest accuracy, but the, uh, but the best fairness. Um, and you have these other points in between. Uh, unfortunately, you have to take this scatter plot with a big grain of salt, which is the huge error bars. Um, and so these error bars, you can see there are error bars in both directions. Um, the error bars for accuracy are actually a little bit smaller than those for fairness. And, um, I've actually seen that often for many different data sets, and I think the reason is that accuracy is always measured over the entire data, in this case, 1,000 groups, as opposed to fairness, which is measured over subgroups, or with respect to subgroups, and as you saw, these subgroups were very uh, kind of, uh, lopsided, so, uh, so they're, uh, they're, um, out of those 1,000 rows, only 100 or 200 might be in the unprivileged group, and, uh, which, which really increases these error bars. Um, I guess just methodologically, I should have mentioned. Okay, so I, I did um, I, I, ten runs. In each run, I did a random uh, split of seventy-five percent of the data for training, twenty-five percent of the data for evaluation uh, for these. Uh, and then the error bars are showing the standard deviation, and the uh, dot is showing the uh, the arithmetic mean. Oh, one more thing that I need to mention. This dot down here, um, it's labeled dummy. So this is specifically the dummy classifier from second. So second turn has a dummy classifier, and what it does is it always just predicts one data. Uh, in this case, it always predicts a table of this data. Which means that by definition, it's perfectly fair. It, uh, uh, whether, uh, whether a row belongs to the privileged group or to the unprivileged group or any intersectionality of those, it always predicts the, the table of the label. Um, so it doesn't make any difference based on that. So that's how you get to one on the fairness side. On the other hand, on the predictive performance, um, balanced accuracy is 0 0.5 because it's the balance of the accuracy of the two groups. Um, so it's only half as accurate to this. Uh, uh, well, okay. It's, it's, I guess, it's 20% less accurate than the best uh, classifier in this experiment. Um, the other thing about the dummy classifier is um, no error bars because even though I ran it 10 times like everything else, uh, it just always as this uh, metric value, no matter what the state of the data. All right, so now that we have some metrics, we can, actually, I should, yeah, I should keep with the time. Uh, we can look at fairness and pipelines. So how do you make machine learning pipelines more fair? And the answer, um, one answer, is by using what's called bias mitigators. And so let me give you a little bit of a background on um, some of the bias mitigators in a, uh, in a package called AIF360, AIF 360. Um, one of them is a disparate impact remover. What it does is it looks at each of the non-protected attributes and it shifts its distribution so that if it, this one attribute just looked at, uh, looked at in isolation is decorrelated from the protected attributes. Um, so one, one example for that would be, um, I've heard that for military admissions tests, there are these, these, uh, these physical fitness tests, 
and physical fitness tests uh, might have different uh, threshold values for male and female applicants. And so this is really, I, I guess, an, uh, an instance of, uh, well, uh, another way to think about that is that you're shifting the threshold based on the group membership. Um, Reweighing is um, rather than kind of going vertically and changing the values in the columns, it goes horizontally and changes the weight of the rows. And what it says is, well, if in the unprivileged group there were fewer positive outcomes, fewer favorable outcomes in the, in the privileged group, well, let's take some of those favorable outcomes and weigh them more heavily so that overall um, the classifier that you trained from that has seen more of the favorable outcomes for that group than it would have otherwise. And ideally, you, uh, you calculate it exactly so that, uh, so that um, the total weight from those two groups becomes equal. Um, again, I'm, I'm presenting these things. Uh, I think there's a big debate to be had for each one of these whether it's the right thing, um, but, uh, but you can't really make that decision without understanding what they're doing. Right? So, um, calibrated equal odds post processing, um, uh, instead of changing the data before it gets fed into training, it says, okay, let's just train something and then change the predictions of the classifier after that or of the factor after that. And what it does is it basically looks at the, uh, at the decision boundary. It looks at, um, well, the, here's an individual in one group, um, but for fairness, uh, and it got, say, the positive outcome, but for fairness, maybe it would have been more fair than it got the negative outcome, or vice versa. And so it flips some of these decisions um, using a biased coin. Uh, so it basically randomly picks which decisions to flip. Um, there's another one called rejection option classification, which is very similar, but it, uh, it makes these splits uh, deterministically. And in both cases, it, uh, uh, they're, they're trying to make exactly the right number of chips um, so that uh, in the end, you get cats. Um, all right, so these are some of, the, um, uh, some of the algorithms you can use for mitigation. And here's how you would use them in, in our Lally library, which is kind of a wrapper around both scikit-learn and then this AI 360 library. Um, maybe let's look at the picture up here first. So disparate impact remover, it's a pre-processing um, mitigator. So it changes the data before it even gets used for training. And in this case, um, what it does is it, um, you still want to pre-process your original data um, say with the one hot encoding and the min-max scaling and so on, but only for the non-protected attributes. On the other hand, in order to do its mitigation, the uh, disparate impact remover actually has to retain the information about the protected attributes because it is using them to make its mitigation decisions. So, um, so the mitigator basically shifts the distributions after all the data has been turned into numbers and scaled and so on appropriately based on the, dis uh, based on the protected attributes. And then the outcome of that uh, becomes uh, the input of the gradient boosting classifier, or whichever final classifier you, uh, you choose to put into the pipeline. Now, in code, um, it kind of looks similar. So the disparate impact remover over here is the outermost call. It, uh, one of its arguments, or I guess two of its arguments, I should say, because of the star star, is the fairness information. This is the exact same fairness information that we used to instantiate metrics earlier. And then, um, Another argument is the pre-processing sub-pipeline, which goes up here. And then finally, uh, so this greater, greater symbol in Lale, it's, uh, it's the pipe combinator. It basically says, pipe the output from what you just did as the input into what you're doing next. So we are piping the output from, uh, from the disparate impact remover into the input of the gradient boosting classifier over here. Um, I should mention one more combinator, which is the AND combinator, which basically uh, says, well, here's this one sub-pipeline, you do one thing, here's another sub-pipeline, you do another thing, they are independent, and then they can be, uh, I guess, the output from both can be piped into a uh, concatenation uh, operator. All right, anyway, so how do these bias mitigators do? Um, so for this experiment, I created a choice of disparate impact remover and all the other bias mitigators I showed on the previous slide, and then finally reject option classification. Um, and then I created this exact same plot that we saw before. And in fact, I uh, kind of as a baseline included the non-mitigated gradient boost classifier. Uh, so there's no mitigator in there. And also the dummy classifier. Dummy classifier is still the most fair. Um, 
the good news is all these bias mitigators seem to have shifted um, uh, the predictions to be somewhat more fair. Unfortunately, the bad news is none of them have accomplished perfect fairness. Um, and then the other thing is, uh, uh, I guess, calibrated equal odds post-processing for the particular data set didn't work all that well. Um, on the other hand, the other three, uh, uh, disparate impact remover, reweighing, and reject option classification, and that's, you, you can see some differences uh, in, in their fairness and in their predictive performance, but really um, it's, it's almost a noise because of the, uh, of the other bars. Um, nevertheless, for the rest of this presentation, I am going to pick the reject option classification. Um, even though it's noisy, it's a fairly likely candidate for having uh, accomplished the most for the particular agency. All right, so um, as you saw, there's this pre-processing block in here, um, and you might want to put different things in there. And so um, specifically, one of the things you might want to change is how you're encoding categorical values. And so for this experiment, I'm including one hot encoder and ordinal encoder, both of which are in scikit-learn. And then I'm in including a couple of other uh, encoders, which are in uh, the category encoders package, which is another scikit-learn compatible uh, package. Um, just to see, okay, what, what impact do they have on the predictive performance of the final model of the, of the entire pipeline? And um, as you can see, the hashing encoder for this data set is a uh, really bad idea because it's both less fair and less accurate, or it leads to a pipeline that's both less fair and less accurate than uh, using the other encoders. On the other hand, uh, with the other encoders, um, the differences seem to be fairly small. Maybe target encoder has a little bit of an edge, uh, at least according to this, uh, to this experiment. Um, again, every, all the error bars are based on 10 uh, rounds of random switch. Okay, so, now one other thing um, that I want to showcase, basically, uh, let me actually step back a little bit. So, much of the fairness literature, so if you look at uh, academic papers on fairness mitigation, um, uh, presents clever new algorithms with a clever math that goes into them, um, that works for data sets that are completely numeric and simple uh, estimators and, uh, and might not necessarily be directly usable in the context of a darker pipeline. And so that's why here I'm showing, okay, well, what if you wanted to do also pre-processing for categorical features? Um, this is how you do it. And so in the next step, I'm going to show what if you also want to do ensembling. And so um, you might want to do, um, for instance, a bagging ensemble. And there are lots of different options of what you could try. So in this case, I'm saying, well, let's do a bagging ensemble where you have a disparate impact remover with a gradient receipt classifier. And uh, in fact, it's a bag of five of those. Um, so the motivation for that might be um, that banging ensembles often reduce noise, and as we saw, this, this, uh, these error bars are pretty big, and so, uh, so there's some motivation to try to squeeze them down, right? And then um, for the other example, I'm showing, okay, well, what if you wanted to do a stacking ensemble? So the idea for a stacking ensemble is a heterogeneous ensemble, where you're, doing, uh, you're using a heterogeneous set of different uh, base estimators. In this case, I'm going to use uh, Gaussian naive base, um, decision tree classifier, gradient boosting, I think can use neighbors. Oh, yes. One minute ago. Oh, one minute ago. Okay. That was the one minute finger. <laughs> All right. Maybe I'll, uh, I'll thank you. Um, uh, so maybe let me get to, uh, to a couple of things here. So uh, actually, just, I mean, the results show that uh, banging and stacking didn't do all that well for this data set, the reject option classification without any ensembling uh, still came out on top. Um, now, another thing you might want to do is uh, automated machine learning. So, um, uh, so trying to use, say, a Bayesian optimizer, for instance, to make the choices for you. Now, there are a bunch of challenges that you have to deal with, and uh, one of them is that, well, now you're trying to optimize for multiple objectives. Most Bayesian optimizers will only optimize for one. Um, I'm going to, uh, to deal with that by just uh, combining both disparate symmetric disparate impact and balance accuracy uh, using the harmonic mean. And then another uh, issue is, well, all these, these big error bars, uh, they really get in the way of optimal ML. 
uh, because AutoML is trying to optimize something, and then what if it doesn't even know which, uh, where the two fonts are, uh, where they are with respect to each other? And um, so I'm, I'm basically using kind of uh, standard practices of, well, you use k-fold cross-validation, you can even repeat that to get uh, the error curve down a little bit. Another idea is to stratify not just by outcomes, but also by the uh, projected attributes. Um, I'm going to skip this slide because it's very code heavy. Um, but over here is basically, uh, we are doing AutoML over the choice of both the encoders and the final estimators. And we are finding that um, according to AutoML, this pipeline did best. According to AutoML, this pipeline was the second best. But as a, as a matter of fact, um, uh, they're kind of hard to compare, right? The, the, neither of them uh, dominates the other in a very optimal sense. And the, and, and the third pattern is this one over here. But the good news is um, they, uh, uh, AutoML did manage to find a point that, uh, that is um, both re um, reasonably fair compared to the other experiments that we saw before and um, uh, on the higher end of all the accuracies that we have seen before. All right, so to conclude, um, fairness value judgments are very important. Um, I've given you various backgrounds to, uh, to how to think about that. Um, I, I, uh, I'm not an authority on, how, on making them work. Um, but uh, whatever judgment you arrive at, the next step is, okay, how do I accomplish that? And that's where you want to know the algorithms. And the, uh, so in this talk, I uh, showed fairness data, fairness metrics, various mitigators, fairness and algorithm now. Uh, all the experiments in this talk are based on our open source library uh, called Lani. Uh, there's a URL. I encourage you to try it out. And uh, if you want to pitch in and contribute, uh, that's always fun. Thank you. We have a couple of minutes for questions. Yes, yeah, so uh, I understand that it may they the fairness, but uh, I see the accuracy also improve. How do you expect the improvement from accuracy coming from? Um, so the algorithm is targeting to improve the fairness, but you see sometimes the accuracy also improving. Um, right. What is the main reason you think the improvement coming from? That's a great question, and I don't really have a good answer. It's, it is a little surprising because most of the time mitigators, unfortunately, great accuracy. Um, the improvement seems to be fairly minimal, um, so maybe it was nice. That's my theory. Yeah. First, so, obviously, uh, Lala did a lot of things, or a lot of things, but so, the best case of scoring metrics you might there, many of them are very much needed. Are you interested in seeing those metrics get picked up by scikit learn? Are you interested in that? Oh, that would be fantastic. Yes. Sure. Okay. I would love that, because that, I mean, Lala is kind of it has a relatively modest small user base. Cycle Learn is used very widely, and so if those metrics work in Cycle Learn, then a lot of people would uh, not have to go out of their way to use them, and we'll see a lot of people that way. Yes, on the API 17, I think, um, on the preparation, you have your own syntax for your processing. What's preventing you from using how to ask over there? Like, what's the restriction? Uh, yeah, we could have used how to ask over for this particular case. Um, and in fact, uh, uh, it would have looked relatively similar. Um, now, there is one place, so this slide shows two combinators, the pipe combinator and the AND combinator. Now there's a third combinator that we have in Lale that, uh, for which scikit-learn doesn't have an equivalent, and it's the OR combinator. The OR combinator, for instance, on line 13, um, introduces an, uh, an algorithmic choice. And, uh, and for automated machine learning, it's nice to be able to concisely express that. I guess I'll look. Um, so this is this is the API for making for doing choices. Is that yeah. right? Exactly. Okay. And then um, maybe since I'm on the slide, I want to pitch one other thing. Is um, you can see that I left off the hyperparameters for gradient boosting classifier, for instance, and that's the syntax for saying um, what an should search. Just not saying what they are. They leave five minutes for shuffle time because uh, the next session is around. Oh, sure. Yeah. yeah. So, since you specifically mentioned the first three metrics are not about 
uh, does not include the white hat, mm -hmm. and so that does so that to me that just makes the symmetric um, disparate impact are about the data and not about the model. Then why do you still choose to show still choose the symmetric disparate impact as the fairness? Metric when you're evaluating between accuracy and fairness. Because you can apply it to the data that you get by taking the predictions as well. Uh, so the uh, predictions, because, because you can take the predictions of the model and you can use those as why and plug them on the component. So, uh, so when you're doing the metric, uh, you're actually getting the prediction. Exactly. Yeah. All right. Thanks a lot, everybody. Sorry for staying on.